This week on the A Push Show, we see the rise of mass politics. Will democracy be truly extended to other people in the country, or is it just a bunch of gobbledygook made up by Andrew Jackson to win votes? We shall see. We'll also see the idea of our federal union. Who's going to have power, the national government or the states? Will they be able to keep people together, or will there be an early civil war before the actual civil war? And then we'll also see the removal of Native Americans. Americans. Native Americans were seen as an obstacle in the way of white progress. Hmm, I wonder if people realized back then that that was racist. Probably not, or they just didn't care. Hmm, I guess we'll still have to see. We'll also talk about Jackson and the bank war. We've seen war on all sorts of things, but a war on banks? What did he have against banks? Maybe they said something bad about his wife. And then we'll look at the changing face of American politics. There's going to be a new party in town, and everybody's going to wig out about it. All this and more this week on The A Push Show. So this chapter is all about the age of Jackson and actually a few presidencies beyond Jackson's presidency. So we'll start right with the Jackson inauguration. Jackson championed himself as a man of the people in a lot of ways he was. It's also important that being a man of the people at that time meant being a man of white men as women, blacks, and Native Americans were removed from the political process and were therefore not really a part of the American people in terms of power. However, as far as moving the needle toward democracy, Jackson certainly did that as he successfully appealed across economic lines and his inauguration reflected that. After he was sworn in, Jackson held a big reception at the White House, which was open to the public, which is an insane idea to think of happening today. Imagine after the next election, either Joe Biden or Donald Trump were to have a big party and literally anybody could go. That would be bananas. Just as you'd suspect, an open party at the White House got a little out of hand. The party lasted multiple days as members of the public got rowdy, got drunk, ruined the carpets, ruined the furniture, and did God knows what else in the White House. I bet you're right, Taft. I bet someone did poop or pee someplace where they shouldn't have. Well, it happens with some of us more so than others. Doesn't it, Taft? Mm hmm. Some praise this event as a proud day for the American people, whereas others clutched their pearls and swooned like Victorian ladies, whereas they perceived the crowd as a microcosm as to how reckless American democracy had become. But in discussing the story of Jackson the man, his story was about as perfect as someone's story could have been at that time if they're trying to run for president. He came from a very modest background as his parents were immigrants from Ireland. He took part in the American Revolution when he was only 13 years old and he was slashed in the face with a sword by a British officer when Jackson refused to clean the officer's boots. Jackson was largely self-educated, became a lawyer for land claims, got elected to the Tennessee State Congress, got elected as a U.S. congressman, was a successful planter and merchant, joined the Tennessee State Militia, and his military success earned national acclaim that put him in the White House eventually. He would come to be known throughout the country as Old Hickory because he was as tough as a branch from a hickory tree. Hickory wood is very tough wood, I guess. No, I'm not much of a wood guy, so I couldn't really tell you for sure. However, he was also very much a man of his time in a bad way. By that I mean by modern standards and even standards back then, he was a brutal bastard to brown folks. Jackson owned roughly 300 enslaved people as he held one of the largest plantations in Tennessee. He also achieved early military success fighting Native Americans and was often criticized for overly violent and brutal strategies. 
Don't forget in Chapter 7 it mentions the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814 when Jackson was fighting the Creek tribe near Florida and he oversaw the slaughter of the Creeks, including many women and children. However, his brutal treatment of the natives and his love of slavery were often seen as good things to the voting public of the 1820s, and this is a reminder to us of just how deep feelings of racism go back in this country. Not only was it okay to want to kill natives and enslave black people in those days, large success in doing both of those things could get you elected president. And that legacy could earn you a spot on one of the most coveted items in America today, the $20 bill. Yep, Jackson is on there. 300 slaves he owned. One of the achievements of the age of Jackson was the expansion of democracy. The book uses the term franchise, which means to give privilege, and in this case, that privilege is voting rights. Disenfranchised generally means to not have voting privileges. Women back then were disenfranchised as they did not have voting rights anywhere until 1920, and almost everywhere blacks were disenfranchised. Pennsylvania amended its constitution to take away voting rights from blacks in 1838. Wasn't the first time they took away rights from black people and it certainly wouldn't be the last. The franchise was usually only extended to white males who paid taxes and or owned land. The franchise began to be broadened in some places even before Jackson was elected. This was done in many eastern states to add an incentive to try and keep people to stay in their states and not move west. But during Jackson's presidency and beyond efforts to extend the government franchise of voting rights was demanded with increasing intensity. For example, in Rhode Island, a group of white male suffragists tried to expand the franchise. And by the way, suffrage is a term that means the right to vote. I know there's a whole lot of words that essentially mean the same thing, but that's just kind of how history in life is. Strap in, kids, and learn some words and realize you're never going to learn them all and you're going to sound kind of stupid sometimes. A lawyer by the name of Thomas Doerr in Rhode Island led these white male suffragists to get reforms to the state constitution that would increase voting rights to more people. They were largely ignored, however, and the argument usually went against them that those who had property should have more power because having property is having power. Doerr and people who supported his cause argued that if those with property have all the power, they rig the government so that they keep their power and the country was founded on people's rights right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not property. It's interesting to note that Thomas Jefferson stole that aspect of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from John Locke, who actually wrote that people have the right to life, liberty, and property. But Jefferson changed it from pursuit of happiness to property because property sounded a little aristocratic-y, which is kind of why they were fighting the revolution to begin with. But going back to Rhode Island, Dorr fought the government of Rhode Island and made his own constitution and even made his own state government, meaning the state had two state governments, and even tried to storm the arsenal of the state of Rhode Island and lead a full-on rebellion. The effort failed and Dorr was briefly imprisoned. However, his message did get across and Rhode Island caved to further enfranchisement like many states had done so already. And this led to further reforms in the democratic process beyond just more people being able to vote. The method to vote for president was altered as well. The way the presidential election works is that the president is voted on by the Electoral College, which is basically all the senators and U.S. congressmen, and usually they vote according to how people vote in the presidential election. For example, in 2020, the amazing and flawless state of Illinois, because of its population, has 18 U.S. congressional districts, so 18 congresspeople plus two senators for a grand total of tapped... No, it would actually be 20. It would actually be 20 and not 5 zillion. Um, 5 zillion is not even a real number. So this would mean that if Joe Biden were to win the majority of votes in the state of Illinois, he would get 20 electoral college votes. In 1800, in 10 of the 16 states, the state legislatures chose who their electors would vote for in presidential elections. The people actually had very little say. The reason people did it that way was because the government back then didn't really trust people to make those decisions. We still have the Electoral College today because it's really 
hard to change because it would require an amendment to the Constitution, and it allows small states to have a lot of power. But this kind of stinks for people that live in big states because it means our votes are worth less than people in small states. For example, if you do the math, my vote for president in this upcoming election is three times less valuable than a person's vote in the state of Wyoming, based on how many people can vote there and the amount of electoral college people they get to vote for. By 1824, in all the states except South Carolina, the electoral votes were chosen by the people. These votes were great in terms of increasing political power for more white males as participation in the process went from 27% in 1824 to 81% in 1860, as you can see in that nice purple graph. It's also interesting to note that for women, Native Americans, and African Americans, their participation rates went from 0% to zero percent in those very same years. In terms of a more anecdotal look at how the rise of mass politics in the democratic system in the United States Republic went, we look at Alexis de Tocqueville. One early study of the Republic came from him as he was sent by France to study prisons, but soon studied all aspects of American life, not just prisons. His book, Democracy in America, marveled at the ability of Americans to gain and lose wealth, which was not quite a thing in Europe as their social structure was far more rigid. He also marveled that American democracy, but pointed out its limits as he wrote that blacks, Native Americans were both left out and made miserable via tyranny, and that tyrant was the same person, the white men that created and maintained the American system of racism. His book was hugely influential in Europe and functions as a portrait of American life at that time from an outside perspective. Now, moving on to political parties. Remember that political parties were seen as bad things in the early days of the United States, but by the the age of Jackson, that all changed. Parties emerged as a rather unavoidable element of democracy, and as the second party system emerged, the first system being the Federalists and the Republicans, many argued that parties were good as they allowed some necessary checks and balances in government, and parties allowed different groups to have representation within the country rather than just a few elites. Parties were seen as necessary institutions. During the age of Jackson, two parties emerged. You had the Whigs who opposed Jackson. The the Whigs were called that because they named themselves after the Whigamores, which was a political group from 17th century England that tried to keep the king in check. The American Whigs thought that Jackson was trying to be a king and that the Whigs would be able to keep him in check. So really, the Whigs were born in opposition to Andrew Jackson. And on the other side, you of course had the Democrats, that is the Democratic Republicans who supported Jackson. They simplified their name from Democratic Republicans to just Democrats. And yes, this is the same Democratic Party that we see today, and it is the oldest party still in existence in the United States. However, as we will see, the core beliefs of the Democratic Party would change pretty dramatically between the 1820s and now. Jackson tried to paint himself as the president of the common man. He would say he favored no group or class of people over any other, but he definitely did the best he could to maintain oppression and subjugation over women, natives, and African Americans. He did, however, go after entrenched elites in government, especially if they were from the East Coast. The spoil systems, as it's mentioned in your book, was the method to whom he appointed for federal offices. Jackson would remove many entrenched federal appointments. Many of these people were admittedly incompetent and and or corrupt, but many were not. The spoil system was a creation of Jackson, and it was a means of appointing people who were loyal to the president's party, the Democratic Republicans, a.k.a the Democrats. Jackson would say to the victor goes the spoils, and your spoils if you helped a guy become president was a pretty dope government job. He not only created the spoil system, but he also replaced the system for a party to nominate a president. Before that, it was a party committee or caucus that decided the party's nominee. He changed it to a national party convention in which members of the party would gather and decide. In reality, it was basically just a bigger caucus and people had very little say in the matter at that time. The spoil system as well as the new convention exposed the limited nature of democratic reform. The next 
next section of the book discusses challenges to the federal union. During this time, the United States was referred to as these United States rather than the United States. And the nullification crisis that emerged illustrates that. It starts with Jackson's vice president, South Carolinian John C. Calhoun. He was a rising star in national politics and at first a key guy in Jackson's cabinet. The cabinet is basically the president's core advisors. However, the tariff of 1828, aka the tariff of abominations, was seen in South Carolina as the reason for all of their problems. In reality, it was more because the soil in South Carolina stunk because they exhausted it and better harvests came from the fertile soils to the west in Alabama and Mississippi. Nevertheless, to try and stop the tariff, Calhoun came up with the theory of nullification, which was basically a resurrected version of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which tried to make the claim that states could nullify federal laws and policies that they felt were unconstitutional rather than the Supreme Court. Enter Martin Van Buren, founder and patron saint of the New York street gang, the Van Buren Boys. Watch out for the Van Buren Boys. Martin Van Buren was also a rising star in national politics and also a key member in Jackson's inner circle. However, Van Buren was soon boxing out Calhoun as he was able to win favor with Jackson. Apparently, there was an issue with a senator's wife, Peggy Eaton, who was seen as a woman of ill repute. Basically, there are allegations that this senator and Peggy Eaton were having an affair while Ms. Eaton was still married to her previous husband, who had since passed away. All the other members of Jackson's advisors, a.k.a. his cabinet, were pressured by their own wives to refuse Ms. Eaton because of her bad reputation. Well, this pissed off Jackson big time because of what rumors did to his previous wife. It killed her. Kinda. She was actually very, very depressed and had a heart condition, but when you accuse her of bigamy, it basically sent her into a depressive funk and maybe exacerbated her heart condition. But I digress. Jackson demanded his cabinet let in Miss Eaton into their social circle, and most of them did. Van Buren let her in very early because he didn't have a wife. He was a widower. His wife passed away. Calhoun, on the other hand, did not accept Miss Eaton as his wife refused to allow her in their social circle, and that really put Calhoun in the outs with Jackson and thus pretty much ruined Calhoun's chances at becoming president. Van Buren would succeed Jackson, thus making him the eighth president of the United States, as we'll see later in the chapter. And the secret sign of Van Buren would be the eight. So if you ever get encountered by the Van Buren boys, just flash the eight. Ooh! and they'll leave you alone. Flash the eight, Taft. You don't want to get roughed up by the Van Buren boys, do you? Yeah, exactly. No, you won't. You will not. The nullification crisis took on crisis levels when debates regarding slavery in Western lands escalated to debates on the integrity of the Union and states' rights versus national power. The webster hayne debate discussed what rights states had in response to federal policies that they didn't like. Daniel Webster, namesake of Webster Middle School, was a Whig Northerner who argued for maintaining the Union, whereas Hayne, who was a Southern Democrat, was coached by Calhoun and argued that states could nullify unconstitutional federal policies relating to things like slavery in the West or abominable tariffs that people in South Carolina hated. The debate was fierce, and Jackson was asked to weigh in, and he said, Our federal union? It must be preserved. This put more pressure on Calhoun, who was a South Carolina senator at this point and no longer vice president. Calhoun in South Carolina voted to nullify the tariff and tried to get other states to join, which they didn't. Jackson strengthened military presence in South Carolina to show that he meant business. Violence seemed imminent until Henry Clay, a newly elected senator from Kentucky, intervened and suggested a compromise. The tariff would be lowered gradually over the next 10 years years. This seemed to make everyone happy. Violence was avoided and Calhoun and South Carolinians would claim victory as the tariff would be gone eventually. It also showed that the federal government still reigned supreme and that if a state wanted to defy said government, it would not be able to do so alone. Ooh, foreshadowing a civil war, perhaps? Hey, Taft, do you know what foreshadowing means? How'd you know that? Well, well, well. As bad as you are at math, you are really good at context clues. 
color me impressed. Which brings us to the section of the chapter discussing the removal of Native Americans, which as you can gather by the section title as well as a little bit of knowledge of American history is one of the more disgraceful periods of American history. Treatment of the natives had always been pretty bad, but during the age of Jackson, things got even worse. A generation previously, Jefferson at least had a slight paternalistic attitude towards the natives and that they were noble savages, his words, not mine who could become civilized. Basically, the best thing Jefferson could say about the natives was that they were smart enough to act like white people. Jackson reflected the white attitude of his time, which was increasingly hostile towards natives. Remember, Jackson made a name for himself nationally by fighting brutal wars against the natives and, like most white Americans, wanted natives that remained east of the Mississippi to move further west away from whites. White people had developed a growing belief that coexistence with the natives was out of the question and that natives would only stand in the way of acquiring highly sought after land in the West. Removal of the natives was often a very ugly and brutal process, as was the case of the Black Hawk War in Illinois. And yes, the Chicago Black Hawks are named for the native tribal leader and as we shall see, maybe not the most appropriate name for a sports team. Black Hawk led an alliance of the Sauk and Fox tribes. A treaty had had been signed by a rival tribe that ceded the land of Black Hawk and his followers. But since Black Hawk and his followers didn't actually sign it, the rivals did, Black Hawk and his followers didn't honor it. So Black Hawk and his followers occupied the vacant land that was within this treaty, and of course white settlers got nervous that an invasion was imminent, so they sent in the militia. The ensuing Black Hawk War was notable for how vicious the white Illinois militia was. The white militia vowed to exterminate the natives and even attack the natives when they tried to surrender. As the Sox and Foxes attempted to retreat across the Mississippi River, the white militia continued continued to chase and slaughter the defeated and starving survivors. Black Hawk was captured and paraded around the country so that people could see him, kind of like a freak show. After his tour, he was released to join his fellow Sauk and Fox natives in Iowa where he spent his remaining days lamenting his lost lands and hoping the settlers would treat the land of his ancestors with honor. But hey, why not name a hockey team after a group of natives who were cheated, slaughtered, removed, and made completely miserable by the American experience? Go Hawks! I'm not going to become a Sabres fan. It's so stupid that you're a Sabres fan. No, I'm not. I'm not stupid. I'm actually a very smart man. Native removal was even more dastardly to the south, where the five civilized tribes of the Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw tribes occupied Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Florida. They were called civilized as they had developed settled agrarian societies rather than hunting-based societies, had written laws, and had adopted many of the aspects of life that white people had considered civilized. However, none of that mattered as white people took away their land anyway. Even though some whites advocated for honoring the Cherokee Nation as it functioned in a way that many assumed a nation should. White impatience to take those lands could not be held off, however, especially not by a president who was about as openly hostile towards natives as one could be. State encroachments were laid for a while with the Worcester v. Georgia decision, but the Removal Act along with state pressure would be too much to stop the natives from getting their land stolen by the United States. Jackson didn't even care that the Supreme Court sided with the natives natives in the Worcester v. Georgia decision saying, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. John Marshall couldn't enforce it and wouldn't enforce it. So Jackson hastily put together a treaty which was signed by a few non-elected members of the Cherokee Nation and zero of the elected members. The Cherokee were given five million and a reservation west of the Mississippi for their trouble. When a few Cherokee refused to leave, Jackson sent an army of 7,000 under the command of General Winfield Scott to round them up and force the natives to leave at gunpoint. The removal of the natives would be infamously remembered as the Trail of Tears, and as the name would suggest, it was incredibly depressing as it was disgraceful. Nearly 1,000 Cherokees initially fled to North Carolina and settled on a small reservation in the Smoky Mountains, which still survives to this day. The rest were forced to trek to Indian Territory, which would later become Oklahoma. The journey was arduous and hopeless, as many traveled with whatever they could carry to a land they didn't want to go to. 
Some died along the way, and none would ever forget the trail where they cried. Jackson would try and justify the journey as a means of protecting the natives from further injury or oppression, even though he was largely responsible for those injuries and oppressions. The other tribes of the five civilized tribes were also forced west, but the Seminoles, not so much. They resisted along with the help of formerly enslaved African Americans who had escaped and joined the tribe. The Seminoles fought bitterly in the jungly Florida Everglades and managed to resist at the cost of 1,500 American troops and $20 million. Most of the Seminoles would eventually be forced west, but the U.S. never fully succeeded in removing all of them. The natives would be pretty much entirely removed from all desirable areas of the U.S. east of the Mississippi by 1830. Any tiny possible notion of a peaceful and equitable coexistence of whites and natives was gone from mainstream American society by the mid-19th century. Americans desired to move westward and occupied virgin territory, as they called it, giving it a creepy, rapey metaphor, and natives were seen as nothing more than an obstacle to this conquest. Alternatives to removal were nearly impossible as Americans shared Jackson's attitudes that the natives couldn't possibly live as equals to whites as they were naturally inferior in their mind. Again, we see racist attitudes as a means of justifying white exploitative behavior in American history in the same spirit as racism was used to justify the enslavement of African people. But hey, at least we got some names of some cool sports teams, so that makes it even for the destruction of an entire culture and most of an entire group of people. Moving on from Native Americans to banks. Though Jackson had no problem with using federal power to check rebellious states and to remove Native Americans, he opposed concentrating federal power when it came to economic issues like infrastructure improvements and economic matters, especially when it came to the Second Bank of the United States. Jackson hated the National Bank, just as Taft hates my new humidifier. No, Taft, it won't slaughter us at all. It'll only minimize the itchiness and dryness that we will inevitably experience in what should be a very long miserable, isolated winter. The bank was run by a guy named Nicholas Biddle, and by most accounts, he did a pretty good job at banking. Currency was stable, state and local banks were stable and safe for storing money, loans were issued that allowed business to grow, and things by most accounts were good, but the banks were seen by Jackson as sources of Eastern elitism at the expense of the people and therefore must be destroyed. Two types of people opposed the bank, hard money and soft money advocates. Hard money advocates Advocates wanted money to be harder to come by, hence the name, meaning fewer dollar bills going around. Dollar bills, in their mind, should represent an amount of gold or silver. They worried that if too many dollar bills, aka banknotes, were in circulation, the dollar would lose value and the economy would be wrecked. Soft money people wanted the opposite. They wanted money to no longer be tied to gold and silver. This, in theory, would mean more money in circulation, which allows more people to have money, more people to spend money, more growth in the economy, and more wealth and happiness for the nation, as long as inflation doesn't get too bad. Both soft money and hard money folks saw the Bank of the United States as an obstacle to their aims. Nicholas Biddle sought allies in Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. With their help, Biddle managed to help convince Congress to pass a bill to renew the charter of the Bank of the United States. Jackson, of course, vetoed the bill, and the bill didn't have enough votes to override that veto. However, this was expected by Clay and Webster as they hoped the issue would help Clay win the presidency. Clay ran against Jackson in the election of 1832 and got whooped. The bank war did not matter much as Jackson won 55% of the vote and an overwhelming victory by presidential election standards. With re-election in hand, Jackson was even more determined to destroy the monster that was the Bank of the United States. Jackson wanted to destroy the bank before its charter expired, so he first went about weakening it by removing all federal money in the bank. By the way, when you put money in a bank, it's called a deposit. That's what they call it. Jackson had to fire two secretaries of the Treasury because they refused to follow his orders as it was so incredibly financially reckless. But Jackson eventually found some 
someone who would follow his orders in Roger Taney, a man with a remarkably hateable face. The government took out all its deposits, which would really hurt the bank because the government had a lot of money in the bank. This meant that the bank had way less money to issue loans and collect interest on said loans. But Nicholas Biddle did not go down without a fight. He raised interest rates and called in loans to help increase the amount of money the bank had. He said he did this to keep people's money safe, but in reality, it was more so to create a mini-recession which he hoped would persuade Congress to renew the bank's charter. It didn't work. The recession pissed everyone off, including Biddle's own supporters. He eased up on his credit squeeze and ruined his chances at getting a renewed charter. Jackson won the bank war. The national bank would be replaced by state banks and ensured a chronically unstable banking system that significantly hindered the country for over 100 years. After he destroyed the National Bank, Jackson moved to destroy the Supreme Court. When John Marshall died in 1835, Jackson appointed his same guy, Roger Taney, who still had a face you just want to swear at, to fill his vacancy. However, the Taney Court would not destroy the power of the Supreme Court, but it would give more rights to the states. This was evident in the Charles River Bridge v. Warren Bridge decision, in which the court decided the state could grant a second charter to another bridge company to prevent provide a free bridge. What this case showed, apart from bridge politics in Massachusetts, was that the Taney Court would decide for states' rights and would rule against privilege at the expense of opportunity for white men to make money. Which brings us to the changing face of American politics. As I had mentioned earlier, the Whig Party would emerge in opposition to Jackson's policies, which many categorized as tyrannical, especially the nullification issue, the banking issue, and the spoil system. The Democrats and Whigs would make up the second party system as the Democrats supported Jackson and Whigs opposed him, calling him a tyrant and a wannabe king. The Democrats under Jackson were all about opportunity for white men to succeed. Government could keep the country unified and should do all it could to remove obstacles that prevented white men from having an opportunity to success. This meant that centers of corrupt privilege, like the one Jackson perceived in the Second National Bank, should be rooted out and destroyed whenever possible. Democrats were usually working men, small businessmen, and many Southerners who distrusted Northern industrial expansion. The Whigs, on the other hand, favored an expanded federal government and an industrial and commercial United States. Similar in a lot of ways to the Federalists of the First Party system. Whigs were suspicious of westward expansion and wanted stronger national banking and financial institutions. Whigs were usually wealthier, very heavily supported in the Northeast, and were supported by Southern planners who saw opportunity in expanding northern industry. However, both the Whigs and the Democrats were about winning and were willing to bend their stance on certain issues if it meant victory. The Whigs would heavily attack the Freemasons, which was sort of a secret society that people suspected as trying to secretly run the country and subvert the will of the people. The Whigs would attack Jackson and Van Buren for being Freemasons, which they were, and accuse them of trying to secretly create an undemocratic Mason-run society. As for cultural lines of the party, Irish and German Catholic immigrants usually supported the Democrats, whereas the Whigs were supported by evangelical Protestants, as the Whig party was about modernization, self-improvement, and progress, and evangelical Protestants are all about self-improvement through self-discipline and hard work. Henry Clay's American system was a system focused on economic development and internal improvements to the country, but neither he, John C. Calhoun, or Daniel Webster were able to generate enough national support for their party party to seriously challenge Martin Van Buren. Not only that, but the Whigs never decided on a single candidate either. They submitted several candidates who split the Whig vote and Martin Van Buren won very easily in the 1836 election. As a person, Van Buren was incredibly popular, but not nearly as popular as Jackson and not nearly as fortunate. Early in Van Buren's presidency, the United States was experiencing a boom. Land sales in the West were going great and tariffs were generating enough revenue that the U.S. budget actually had a surplus, meaning they were taking in more money than they were spending. This led to Congress passing the Distribution Act, which meant that the extra money would be given back to the states as basically loans which did not really have 
have to be paid back. The states took that money and quickly spent it on infrastructure projects like roads and canals. However, Jackson worried that a lot of land was being bought by people who didn't really want to own it and just wanted to resell it for a profit. He worried that the banknotes used to buy the land weren't really worth much and that the economy was in a fragile position as too much credit was being given to people to buy land who didn't actually have the wealth to buy said land. So they're buying the land with nothing. Just before he left office, Jackson issued a presidential order known as the Specie Circular that said the government would accept land payments that were in the form of gold or silver coins or banknotes supported by gold or silver. Well, this was bad because a lot of people who bought land didn't have gold or silver and a lot of people got freaked out, panicked. And when you have money, people freak out and panic. They try and pull all their money out of banks, quit hiring people, quit investing in things, and then a depression hits. The depression from the panic of 1837 was the worst the country had seen up to that point. Though depressions are usually the result of numerous complicated factors, the party in charge almost always takes the blame as it's easy for people to understand. Van Buren did succeed in creating an independent treasury, which meant a treasury made by the government would keep the government in a treasury in Washington and little sub-treasuries around the country. There'd be no privately run bank holding the government's money, but a government-run institution instead. With the election of 1840 looming, the Whigs saw a great opportunity to beat a weak candidate in Van Buren. They nominated famous Native American killer in William Henry Harrison as their representative. With increased circulation of cheap newspapers available to everyone, image and branding became much more of a thing, and the Whigs successfully branded Harrison as this simple rustic man who lived in a log cabin and liked alcoholic cider, aka hard cider, which is something a lot of people apparently liked back then. This was interesting because Harrison was actually a very wealthy member of the Western elite who was actually descended from wealthy Virginians and not really a simple log cabin living cider drinking common man, but people bought it. They also bought the Whig presentation of Martin Van Buren of being an aloof aristocrat who drank champagne, ate off gold plates, and hated cider. How dare he hate cider? And here in this image, you sort of see the first ever meme, and it was actually very effective back then. Memes have power, kids. Memes have power. Right, Taft? <laughs> Darn right. Harrison won the election quite easily thanks to the memes. Once in charge, though, the Whigs found their experience to be very frustrating. First of all, William Henry Harrison died of pneumonia a month after becoming president, which is never a good start. Replacing him was Vice President Zachary Tyler, who was a former Democrat who left because he didn't like the egalitarian policies of Jackson. Tyler often took Democrat positions as he opposed Whig efforts like rechartering the Bank of the United States, as well as other internal improvements. The Whigs kicked him out of the party and all all Whig members of Tyler's cabinet then resigned. Tyler replaced those members with Democrats and soon sought to rejoin the Democratic Party, which is wild to think of happening. Imagine the president just switching parties in the middle of his presidency. Nuts. N-U-T-Z. Nuts. What do you know about spelling? In terms of America's standing in the world, the Whigs had mixed success, but more failure than success. In the Caroline Affair, Americans almost came to the brink of war with England over issues in Canada. Canada decided to be revolutionary, guys. Finally. Am I right, Taft? <laughs> Yeah, and sought American support. Canada sent a ship, the Caroline, to America for supplies. However, before it could get to America, British officials seized the ship and burned it and killed one American on board. This enraged Americans who soon arrested a Canadian, Alexander MacLeod, for murder and sentenced him to death. His death would have probably sparked a war had a New York jury not acquitted MacLeod. The Aroostook War sparked when many American and Canadian lumberjacks flooded the Aroostook River region near the border between Maine and Canada and began fighting. No, I'm not making that up. Yes, it was a bunch of lumberjacks fighting and it was the war in American history between lumberjacks in Canada and the United States. What do you think of that, Taft? 
I bet it was quite delicious. In addition to this, a slave ship called the Creole was taken over by the enslaved people on that ship and ended up on a British-controlled island in the Bahamas. The British freed the enslaved people, which enraged American slave owners. In response to these issues, the British government sent Lord Ashburton, who actually admired the United States, to negotiate with Secretary of State Daniel Webster. They agreed on the main border with Canada that actually still exists today, and England promised that the issues of the Creole and the Caroline would be forgotten. The Whigs also got in on trade with China, like pretty much every white-controlled nation did at that time with the signing of the Treaty of Wang Hia. This gave the U.S. the ability to trade and the ability to try its own citizens if they were accused of committing a crime in China. This was kind of a common thing back then because Chinese juries and Chinese judges and Chinese courts were typically very, very brutal to foreigners. And that's it for our show this week week. Tune in next time as we see the Industrial Revolution along with freakish growth of the United States would allow the country to plow full steam ahead into the next era. Should be a pretty steamy time. Thank you guys for watching and don't forget we gotta keep pushing G.